Gaudete, gaudete, Christus es natus, ex Maria Virgine, gaudete. Hello, good day. Uh, uh, you are here with Great Pharaoh and Ivor Kovach, and we are here for another segment of uh, anything from history uh, to biographies. Um, we cover uh, all sorts of uh, major events in history here, and um, and we welcome you. And um, uh, today's segment uh, is going to be on, um, uh, well, my segment will be on St. Veronica Giuliani of Milan. I basically personally came across this uh, saint, uh, saint story, um, you know, while watching um, uh just watching or reading some history as well about the Catholic Church and the the saints uh, during the different uh, eras. And what I found that uh, this uh, Saint uh, Veronica Giuliani is actually a very um, huge saint. I mean, as far as her story goes, um, the things that she did, you know, from the time she was young to her very last day, um, she was a, a great saint in the church. Now, um, not a lot of people know about her uh, in the, uh, you know, as, as Christians in general, whether you're Orthodox, uh, Catholic, Protestant, Methodist, uh, not a lot of people have heard of her because her story has sort of been, um, she's had so many writings and, and documents, but um, her story was was purposely sort of kept, I guess we can say, uh, according to divine providence, because um, perhaps we would get the blessing of being able to share her story with others. So we'll go ahead and start. Uh, basically, uh, St. Veronica Giuliani, she was uh, born of devout parents at uh, Mercatello in Italy. And uh, she basically, uh, uh, you know, grew up in a, uh, a, a very pious family. Um, they were devout Christians, and they would go to church and partake of Eucharist and, and so on and so forth. So St. Veronica, from a very long time, was chosen by God for a great mission, but she didn't realize that till later in her life, and we'll get to that. But it goes, the story goes that when she was a little baby, I mean, uh, you know, pretty much on, only five months uh, old, she miraculously stood up and started walking and put her hands up uh, towards the picture of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus, uh, you know, uh, basically showing a symbol that she wanted to just give them a hug. And um, so at, at basically, basically at the age of five months, she was miraculously started walking. Um, hey, um, all- Great Pharaoh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Could you give a timeline for her birth and death? Like when did she live? Oh right, right. So, um, so she was uh, born actually in um, uh, on uh, December twenty seventh, uh, sixteen sixty, um, mm-hmm. and uh, it was basically in in Mercanto uh, uh, or Urbino, uh, or it's, it says Duchy of Urbino, uh, uh, which is in Italy. So it's it's like really far northwest, right? It's like a small little town next to Milan, okay? So, and then she passed away in 1727. So we're talking about, right? We're talking about, um, you know, uh, 17th century. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, so so that that's, you know, 17th century to 18, early 18th century, okay? So, uh, you know, during this time, the church was, or during her lifetime, the church was, uh, dealing with many uh, outside uh, threats uh, due to heresy and uh, wrong teachings in the church. So um, God will, from time to time, as history has shown us, he will choose people for a certain mission. And the, w- these people are known as the saints that we consider to be saints. Now, you know, the saints that are venerated, as opposed to we say, OK, the saints of the church The ones that are venerated, they're venerated because they lived a very exceptional life and had a great mission that needed to be fulfilled. So uh, basically, uh, there also also uh, was a story 
that when she was even less than a year old, her her aunt, I believe, took her to the market and, um, you know, the, she went to a vendor for oil and he wasn't being honest about it. So she said as a little baby, she said, be honest, you know, the Lord sees everything <laughs> and she's not even one years old. So, uh, you know, th this is a, a story that was passed down. Uh, as well. And and there's many stories, you know, when she was a child and teenager, and we'll go over those, because uh, it's just her whole life is full of, of, of miracles and all sorts of supernatural experiences. So mm -hmm. uh, Saint Veronica also, when, when she got older as a sort of a toddler, so to speak, or you can say maybe about the age of three, uh, three or four years old, she would walk down the hallway where the, her mother had a, a, a beautiful picture of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. And that that be, and, and, and uh, let me let me before I get to this, all of these accounts, most of it we're getting from I, I think I believe all of it we're getting from her actual journals that she wrote when she became a nun. She she went to the monastery of uh, Sita de Castillo. Um, which is kind of like, it's just further, further towards the middle center of Italy. Okay. And, um, basically we're getting all this from her journal. She wrote tons and tons of journals. Okay. Like a, a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of stuff. So that was one of the stories that she mentioned as a kid. So, so she mentioned that basically that picture would come alive and it would actually the, it'd be the real baby Jesus and the mother talking to her. And, and it even, she even explains in one of her, her journals that the, that she basically the Virgin mother placed the baby into her arms and she got to hold the baby for a little bit and, and play with the baby Jesus. And then also she would be in the garden picking flowers and Jesus would, you know, the, the, the toddler Jesus would appear to her, right? So around the same age that she was in, and he would tell her that, you know, I am your true flower, so to speak. So over the years when she began to grow in the faith, right? So God was already working on, on this, on this, the, the, this saint from the time she was just an infant. So you can imagine all these experiences that she's going through. Right. Till the age of about, let's say, 16 or so, where she decided she wanted to become a nun. But what happened was when her mother passed away, she had four other sisters and St. Veronica was the youngest. So she was explaining to all the sisters that they all had a mission to fulfill for the church. But St. Veronica, I give you the cross of Christ. That's what the mother said to her, which was basically sort of a prophecy that she was going to fulfill a very huge mission. Her mother just just knew that. Right. So her mother passed away when she was she was very young. I think she was like maybe four years old or something like that. And uh, when she got older, she continued to grow in the faith and she wanted to become a nun. But her father was doing everything he could to get her married. He tried to find her, you know, uh, lots of different uh, matches, uh, suitors for her, uh, men who were very uh, wealthy and, you know, and very successful, if you will. And she and her father tried to bring her different uh, prospects, so to speak. And she basically rejected every single one of them. She just did not want to get married. Even she had two sisters who became nuns, and the father convinced the sisters to actually to tell her that she can also live a blessed life in the world. She doesn't need to come and become a nun. You can go be married and live a very blessed life as well. But he was the one she went back and told her sister. She said, well, that's unfortunate. You, you were the ones that were supposed to convince me to come to the convent. Um, you know, and th that's so unfortunate, you know. So she was very uh, distraught by that. And, you know, eventually um, she did become a nun. But the story goes that as she was praying, she was looking at a picture of Christ, I believe. And 
she she had a lot of worries and different anxieties about what what the will of God was for her life. And he and I, I guess the story goes that uh, the picture uh, didn't feel like a picture anymore. Uh, it just seemed almost like a real face of Christ was was you know was very beautiful type of scene where where it didn't even feel like a picture anymore. And he would he was talking to her from this picture, telling her, "Don't worry, you know." Um, you will, you know, don't worry, you will become my bride and you will fight, uh, you, you will, you will become, uh, victorious. So I think, I think on a, on a separate sort of, uh, situation, she was in prayer and she heard the voice from within. And she used to mention this a lot, a lot of inner voices, um, that she had to go fight a war. To, she, the, the inner voice saying, there was an inner voice saying, go to war. So she interpreted that like she was going to be a soldier or be in the military or be in some sort of competitive sort of uh, fighting sport. So she got into fencing. So the story goes that she's in the woods, right? And she starts kind of fencing by herself in the woods. And uh, when she goes in the woods, Christ then appears to her and says, this is not the battle that I want you to fight. I want you to fight the spiritual battle for me. And over time, she realized that her calling was to become a nun. And God was going to use her to suffer, to live a life of suffering for the sake of love and the sake of salvation of souls. So the thing about St. Veronica, why she's such a great saint, because oftentimes as Christians, we always focus on the resurrection of Christ. That Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And oftentimes we sort of get away from the fact that he died on the cross, that he suffered for our sins, that there is some sort of suffering that we have to go through in order to show love to others. So that was her whole life. Her whole life was living the suffering and the resurrection of Christ. So we're going to find, you know, throughout her story about many times where she was suffering. So one of the things that happened when she first became a nun, it was a very glorious time for her, right? So she feel, she she almost felt like she sort of sort of dodged, you know, the world so to speak, and she got into this monastery and she just considered it as she wrote in her journal just a very triumphant victorious day, the way she described it and the nuns the tradition goes that they they would just snip a little piece of her hair to show that she basically, um, you know, is giving herself to God and for the and to be a nun at the convent. And she really felt at that point that she was at that point surrounded by angels and, and sort of, you know, uh, war, sort of uh, soldiers of the church, um, so to speak. She felt she felt a form of victory at that point. To finally bypass the marriage, the issues in the world, and to finally fulfill her dream. So when she became a nun, uh, it actually it was actually very difficult for her in the beginning. So so when she was consecrated and everything and became a nun, you know she felt immediately that the nun was like a prison. Her cell was literally a cell, <laughs> as they call it, in a prison. Uh, so that's how it felt at first. So it's like she got what she wanted. She knew what she wanted to get away from. But the problem is she didn't see what she was going to. So she got away from something that she got away from the world. But when she got in herself, she she felt almost that um, uh, that challenge from within. And she didn't know whether it was like a spiritual type of battle from the enemy of good or it was just something out of human weaknesses. She was still trying to figure out why she felt she was in prison, why she felt, you know, that she was sort of confined to this small cell and, you know, she was, you know, not going to do, not know what to do and just feel in prison her whole life. So in one of her journal entries, uh, she says that Satan um, came in the form of uh, a nun, so to speak. And he spoke with, he, he basically looked like the, a, a, a mother or a nun, so to speak, and and spoke like the nun and everything. And what happened was, he, you know, he he knocked on her cell, 
uh, early in her in her life, right, as as a nun, he knocked on her cell while she was praying or reading scripture, what have you. And he comes in and sits down to talk with her and says, you know, I just want to hold a small confession with you and and I just want to give you some guidance. And the first thing he told her, uh, you know, as we say, the enemy of old or the the father of lies and so on and so forth. He said that the mothers can't all be trusted. You can't just share everything with the mothers because um, we have a problem here in the monastery and you can't, uh, they, they, there's a lot of trust issues here. So I, I'm just telling you, you know, just, you know, just kind of keep things to yourself. And uh, she immediately knew that that was Satan at that point. So she didn't, she wasn't tempted to sort of fight the enemy in a very confrontational way. She she just kind of let Satan, you know, just leave after that point. But she knew that that was from the enemy of good, because that's actually the first thing before any sacrificial uh, or any sacrificial practices that you do in the life of faith. Obedience comes first, as the scripture says, obedience is greater than sacrifice. Right. Obedience is life and disobedience is death. So so she knew right away. So. She did trust the, the, the nun. She had a a, a, guy, a a father confession, so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, she would um, she was just growing a lot in the faith. So one of the most profound experiences we, we find is, well, I was going to get to, well, she went through so many different experiences. So I think the first thing uh, that she ex- that she experienced. Um, she always had a relationship with the Virgin Mary. Uh, I know that. Um, yes. So one of the first experiences would be that her heart essentially um, would be removed. Like basically an, an, an angel would come and and remove her heart. Like while she's in prayer, she would go into these states of ecstasy and see these incredible visions. And she would literally see like an angel taking the heart from her body and purifying it of just the stains or impurities and 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 placing the heart back in her chest for instance um there was uh, a lot of experiences she had with 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 suffering she did see like the crucified christ uh so to speak and you know she she asked for for uh for suffering and um i just remember this story when she was also young actually what happened was, uh, as she was in her house, uh, a dog came barking near the door, the front entrance. So her sister quickly closed that door before the dog could get in. And what she did was she purposely put her hands right where, right between the door and the the latch, and she basically wounded her hand, and it was very bloody. And so she had to go to a doctor to bandage and wrap it up. And she said, this was when she was a, a young, maybe four or five years old. And she said, why is a doctor doing this? Shouldn't we suffer for the salvation of souls? And then there was another time. So wait, wait, I got a question. Um, sure. Uh, she put her hands in the door. Like, uh, to, for what reason? Yeah, she wanted, she, she wanted, I mean, basically, she thought that, she thought that that dog, was meant to come and to attack her or something. So, so as her sister was trying to close the door, she put her hand in between the door and the actual, you know, the actual, um, you know, the stud, you know, the the you know where it closed. Yeah, and the door she, frame. Yeah, and so she she ended up bruising her hand, and she did that because she thought that you know she was meant to get attacked by this dog somehow, and. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the story, now, now, yeah, I know. See, the thing is, is a lot of psychiatrists, that, that's the thing with, with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has always been questioned on, you know, a lot of the, the practices and the self-chastening and how they would whip themselves and so on and so forth. Look, I'll tell you this. Uh, they, a doctor would consider these types of things, these types of people, when they see these visions and do these types of things, someone who's maybe schizophrenic. The problem is, is that all her life she was going through supernatural type of healing and supernatural type of suffering. And on top of that, she was a uh, uh, the abbess 
for the whole convent. And she took care, uh, she, later in her life, she managed a lot of uh, projects and spoke with a lot of prominent people in the city. And she managed a lot of things and attended to the needs of many, many nuns. So this was impossible. I mean, she, she clearly had a very different, exceptional life. And she was chosen for the life of suffering as well as the, the, the resurrection, the salvation of souls. So we go back again, we fast forward again to her being back in the convent. And uh, one of the experiences, I think, that she began to do, she began to wear a robe that was made up of thorns, rose thorns. And she would wear this robe while she'd be praying or maybe uh, doing prostrations or, or what have you. And that would be sort of the beginning of the suffering that she would take for Christ. And she constantly asked Christ for suffering. And the reason why was because through her suffering, she was sharing with Christ that suffering because she wanted to suffer on his behalf because he had suffered for her. And that's how she saw it. And at the same time, she was saving souls because when you suffer, when you suffer, you are, you are in fact... Um, growing spiritually and getting closer to God and you become more and more holy and you go through this process that we call deification where we become more and more like you know that we the more of the divine nature of God so so through the suffering so she would wear the robe uh, there was another story I think that she wanted to uh, walk barefoot I think and her father confession said, you know, uh, no, you can't do this. This is not from God. Um, but what happened was um, her feet were swelling really bad. Like her feet really swelled, became very, really big and were swelling. And she went to the doctor for it. And the doctor said, well, you have no explanation for why her feet are swelling. There, there's no other. We can't give any explanation for it. And so what ended up happening was once she was able to once they allowed her to walk barefoot around the convent, which is also a form of suffering, like right? you're stepping on whatever thorns, bushes, uh, uh, you know, br you know, all sorts of stuff. Once she did that, the swelling actually went away. So, so it was actually an obedience to Christ, I think. And then there was like another. She was talking about another experience that she had, where it wasn't so much the suffering. It was when she took Holy Communion, she can actually feel. She can, she almost felt like she was out of her body and experienced a, a great love uh, for God. And she would just forget where she was when she would take the communion. She just felt a huge light from within. And she thought other people were experiencing as well. But really, she was the only one that was experiencing it at the time. And she said that she can smell a sweet aroma. Every person that was partaking of the Eucharist of Christ, the body and blood, which we you know, we, we, we make the, the leavened bread and uh, the, um, the, the, the wine, and we believe that it turns into the body of blood of Christ. So every person that was taking the communion, she can smell a sweet aroma from them, okay? So those were the pleasant things that she was experiencing. She was constantly experiencing a lot of pleasant, beautiful things as well, and we'll get to those things. But in the beginning, in the saint's life, they actually do go through a lot of suffering. God is there supporting them, but they go through a lot of challenges. So as she continued in the spiritual life, Satan was sort of more aggressive with how he battled against her. And basically, like he came in the form of, you know, um, almost like a black, uh, like like a black man, so to speak, or a very, a very ugly you know, uh, evil type of, of, of creature or demon, whatever you want to put it. And he'd come in her cell and he would threaten her while she was praying and tell her, you know, I can tear you apart and I can absolutely, you know, destroy you. And he literally just, he literally grabbed her and threatened her. But at that point, she was already at a spiritual level where she did not fear. She was, she was startled, right? Like she was, her, you know, she was being tested a little bit, but she was she was ready because she basically held her cross and she said, if it is the will of God, then, you know, it, it, life and death are in the hands of God. 
So if it is his will, then you know you'll be able to 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 harm me. And if it's not, then you cannot do anything. And when she said that, he he fled. He immediately just disappeared. So so th- th- this is why she was considered a big saint. Like I-, I know that I'm sort of talking about it. Like you know, it may not seem. Uh, you know, th- these are big experiences, but there's nothing really that I can say personally. I mean, you really just have to take it for what it is because they, they, they were the ones who kind of went through all these, they went through all these experiences and to them, I mean, uh, uh, you know, they were able to handle these kinds of things. So, so as she continued in the spiritual life, there's another spiritual experience that they mentioned where she experienced a spear, a spear being uh, basically penetrating her heart. An angel was behind her holding her to be able to support her to take the pain and to get a little glimpse of the suffering that Kais goes through. And a spear basically going through her heart. Uh, and then she can see Christ being crucified at the same time. So the reason why. The reason why she went through these things was because the sacred heart of Christ is constantly depicted as as uh, having thorns around it with a cross on top and a flame. So the idea this was a spear and it was actually the spear was on fire. So it's actually talking about how Christ's heart is constantly as a flame. It's not like the human heart that we that we have today, this heart of flesh. His heart is actually like a, a, a living flame that's constantly burning for the love of the world, the love of, of, of his people and, the, and all the souls that he's trying to save. So she felt that. She felt the pain, but she also felt that, that, that flame from within. So it actually is a, a, it's suffering, but it's also salvation at the same time, right? Because by basically forgiving people of their of their sins you are giving them life and you're giving them basically hope to continue to move on and persevere in the spiritual life so that can't happen without mercy and we we know the verse in the scripture that says you know mercy triumphs over judgment your mercy is greater than life as david the prophet said in the psalms so uh you know the blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Um, to those who are merciful, he will show himself as merciful. So, uh, you know, and then, you know, and, and, and so constantly, this saint was constantly uh, going through suffering to, to save the souls of many people around her and, and, and to, to say, you know, to um, basically take that suffering. So what ended up happening was, as she was continuing this life of struggle, she carried a, a, her, 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 her fellow nuns around her began to see that some of this behavior was extreme. They thought it was extreme, and they thought that she was going crazy, and uh, they ended up punishing her. I think the, 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 con, the, the, the abbess at the time, or the, the bishop at the time, or the pope at the time basically ordered her to be in an infirmatory, which is a very small a super small cell and you you can't go outside of it for like 75 days or something you know they'll bring you the food drink whatever but you can't it's sort of like a it's like a time out you know <laughs> but, but it's like 75 days okay so so yeah it, it's sort of like an incarceration uh uh further imprisonment so like a cooler that was one of the, pardon like a cooler yeah i mean <laughs> yeah so so the point is is You know, these are the things that she went through because as she was going in the spiritual life, you go through harder types of struggles. Even the people on your own, people who are on your side, the the very people who who you're constantly among, they'll even begin to question some of what you do. So she was she was going through some of that. And um, but you know what? To be fair, you know, like if she Mm. really had been a crazy person. And done something extreme. Like, I mean, every once in a while, something happens, right? Like, you have yeah. uh, people that do go nuts. And when that happens, it makes the whole institution look bad. Like, if somebody goes there and dies or, you know, yeah. kills themselves, like, they don't, you know, they don't want that 
they don't want that kind of bad reputation. So like I can understand, you know, maybe they're like, well, we need to make sure she's not insane. Um, because that's going to really discredit the right, but this was after, Yeah, but this is the thing. This was after they they were able to hear about her different supernatural experiences. Like some of these things they she couldn't hide. Like there's a story just reminded me of uh her heart would be beating so so loudly, so powerfully that the nuns can feel it from the other cells. So, you know, that, you know, which was basically like Christ uh, pouring out his love into her heart at the time. And 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 so there were a lot of things that they were aware of that she was going through. And they knew that she had went to the doctor several times when, you know, she couldn't get permission to do some of these spiritual practices. She would end up getting sick. So one time she wanted to fast. Christ had commanded her in a prayer. He told her, fast for me five years on just bread and water. So she goes to her father confession. You know, you look at the humility of this saint, right? Like this is this is this is God talking to you now. But yet you're still going to the father of confession to ask permission. So the 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 humility is 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 it's transcending human human like rationale most of us would just say do things on our own and whatever opinion we have we just stick to it she was getting her commands from the lord but then would go fuck to the father confession and he would tell her no you, you shouldn't do that that's you're, you're gonna get sick and whatnot so when she would eat anything other than the bread or the water she would vomit it all out like violently just vomiting all the food out and she had to go to the doctor for that. And the doctor said, we have no explanation why she's vomiting this food out. She doesn't have a virus. There's no infection or anything like that. We can't explain this. So the father then allowed her to begin fasting on bread and water for five years. And she didn't have this problem again. Sure, her, she was able to, you know, consume the bread, and drink the water. So, you know, these are these are the things that, that they're, they experience. So. Uh, one of the other things that she she did, she would like write uh, certain letters about the faith of the church. So there was all sorts of heresy that was being passed around at the time, and she would write letters to the bishop explaining, you know, the faith that, you know, we don't believe in this, we don't recognize this, this and that, this and that. So uh, she actually was later known as the doctor of the church for doing things like that. Um, you know, because, you know, that that that's she began she began to fill a much larger role as she grew in the spiritual life. She became more and more responsible for more and more people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, um, so so we go to the next phase of her life. So she she finally, like, you know, begins to experience. Uh, you know, the official like suffering of Christ, which they call is like the stigmata. So saints, they would you would see them having the same wounds of Christ, like on their hands, on their feet, and the wound on their side. And she would experience that. And she would literally, I mean, I kid you not, I mean, she's there praying before the Lord. The, when I'm telling you guys that she's seeing the cross of Christ, I'm not talking about a picture. I'm talking about She's taken into ecstasy. She's put in a place. She's still on the earth, but she's also like in heaven at the same. Christ is showing her himself on a cross, and he's he's passing on those five points of suffering, or the you know the four point five points. So on the feet, the hands, the side, and you also have on the head. So she was she was pierced on all those part on her hands, her feet. She had the wound on the side, and she also had a, a wound in in in, in, the, in her forehead to represent the crown of thorns. So she experienced that. And people say, "Well, why do the saints do this? Why do why do they behave in them? Why do they do these things?" Because they understood that true love comes from suffering, comes from some sort of sacrifice. You know, you can't have a joy in giving unless you truly are given. Right. If you give just from your abundance, you'll never feel have that closeness, that intimacy with giving somebody something. It has to come from the heart. So 
everybody has a capacity of doing this. But the saints were used to do this constantly through their life, like literally the same suffering that Christ was going through. And every time she would have problems with people in the world and, and, and you know, stress in the spiritual life, she would always call them the Virgin Mother. She would teach her everything. She felt that the Virgin Mother was, was like right there with her, helping her out in, in everything. And even the nuns would explain that she was so close to the Virgin Mother that at times when she spoke to them, they didn't even feel that it was St. Veronica speaking to them. They felt that that was the voice of the Virgin Mary. That's how close she was to her. And I'll explain in, and I'll explain in, in a couple more details about that, about how close she was to the Virgin Mary and, and, and following the will. So uh, after many years, she eventually becomes, uh, is, is, is ordained as the, uh, the abbot or is given the responsibility to be the abbess of the convent. So what she did was she went to the picture of St. Mary and Christ. She she had a royal seal of the monastery. I guess it's like the deed or what have you, and the keys to the front entrance. She said, Mary, you know, this is your convent, and and please, you know, you're the abbot of this of this monastery. That's how that's how humble she was. She, you know, uh the the, the first thing that Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. So the saints immediately go to the heaven when they when they're beginning something or some spiritual feat or some project. Their life is continuously surrounded by prayer, and people say, "Well, well, 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 why is that so? What, what, why do you know who can do that? Who can pray twenty four seven? This, this, and that." Well, it's not if you if you think about it that it's 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 a it's such a, a burden. Yeah, of course it, it could be exhausting, but the saints saw it as a way to connect the heavens to the earth. They clearly saw that every time they prayed, they were connecting the earth to the heavenly life, which was continuously saving souls, right? And and less of the world, more 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 heavenly minded, so to speak. So so she did that, and Mary told her, "Don't worry, everything will be fine." You know, I will be there for you. I will guide you and everything will be fine. And she was very loving. Uh, there's one story. She she went to one of the, the nuns. She was just sweeping the floor and she asked her, you know, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm just doing some cleaning. She says, no, you should say I'm loving. I'm loving God. So, so the simplicity of these saints, too, is, is very wonderful as well. It's actually very beautiful because they go through sufferings that is everything but simple. It's almost, it's it's like a true suffering that really makes a person uh, sort of, it it, 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 I mean, it makes that person, develops that person's character, but it also, it also keeps their heart very simple. That, that, that is the beauty of it. So she would, you know, she would always talk about love. You know, even in her deathbed, she just constantly said, love God, love one another, you know, uh, uh, show love to the poor. And she was doing that even before she became a nun. Her mother was constantly giving to the poor. There was another story that her mother made a cake for the family on a certain feast day. And what she did was she went in the kitchen and broke that cake up in all sorts of small pieces. So the mother had no choice. She said to give it to, she had no choice but to give it to the poor. So St. Veronica wanted to give it to the poor. So she broke it up in little pieces. And so she was doing this when she was abbot of the monastery. People would come to the uh, abbot of the convent. People would come for financial help. They need help. People who are suffering, you know, extreme poverty. And she would be able to provide them with something, some money or some clothing or something for their needs. And she was constantly taking care of, of the nuns as well. She was working on some sort of um, uh, uh, irrigation system uh, or a well. Yeah, that's right. A construction of a well. Uh, so that the nuns wouldn't have to go back and forth, uh, uh, you know, uh, different levels of the convent and or go somewhere far to get water, that they would be able to access the water directly from from the from their cells, you know, the the balconies from their cells, what have you. So so that was one of the things she did. She was responsible in different construction and. So she's she's doing all these things and she's just so humble. She's working with everybody. She's cooperating with everybody. You know, and it just reminds us 
that regardless of how you know you are in your spiritual life it actually connects you to people it's not something that sort of gets you away from people you actually become more connected to people and be able to fulfill people's needs rather than their wants right so so that's what she was doing she was giving love everywhere throughout her whole life so uh you know what ended up happening was she had so many experiences that uh, the, her father confession told her to start writing down all the things that you're experiencing. Every, anything that you went through, just start writing them down, writing them down, writing them down. And there are tons. I mean, she wrote, I don't know how many different journal entries, tons of like full notebooks, just full of documentations of things that she experienced. And it, it, it really, I mean, there's definitely the human element of these saints that they sometimes with, with the writing, when they read them, they, she didn't know exactly how to express herself. Sometimes it was clear as day. Um, but what they were able to conclude, the theologians and those who were who'd, who'd studied a lot of her uh, journal entries basically said that she was talking about things that were philosoph super philosophical without even having any background in philosophy. She was saying things that basically brought to light a lot of human reasoning and, and human morality that philosophers wouldn't even be able to come up with. So that was, that was another profound thing, you know, um, you, you know, that she, she was able to write a lot of, um, uh, of, 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 of things that she learned from this experience. And so, uh, one, 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 there's this one story that as she was writing one of her journal entries, Satan came sort of like as a black man into her cell and tried to, you know, intimidate her and, and tell her, you know, stop this, stop these, these cursed writings that you're, you're trying to put together, you know, and, you know, and he just tried to intimidate her, you know, like, I guess, uh, just scare her from writing these journal entries because because these journal entries were, are being used today now to tell her story these the all these stories i'm telling you are from things that she wrote these are directly things that are coming from her journal so so they are being actually he was he was intimidating her to not to not continue writing them and he even like started grabbing the table where she was writing and just started shaking it and got in her face, told her, you better stop this madness. But she wasn't scared. She just held that table down and and she wasn't scared. She took the cross again and, you know, she she you know, she showed him, you know, you know, you know, that that he must flee, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, that he has no power over the cross. He does not have the authority for this and everything has to happen according to the will of God. So once again, Satan vanished from her again, and she continued her journal entries. Now, she was so close to the Virgin Mother that at times when she was writing her journal entries, because the Virgin Mother actually had been also appearing in her cell at times when she needed comfort, at times where she was struggling, going through tough times, she would appear in her cell, and she, would, she the way she described in the journals, she would almost just like melt inside of her robe. And, and, um, and, and so she would just care for her and like, a, like a, a true mother would. So she was so close to the Virgin Mary and she claimed in her journals that she taught her everything. Mary taught her all the virtues, taught her everything, how to deal with people, how to deal with situations, uh, everything. So, so in her journal entries at several times, she refers to the second person. She's saying you Instead of saying I, she's saying you. And she's basically writing in her journal entries what she's saying to the Virgin Mother. And at that point, as you're reading these journals, it's it's very, it's amazing because she didn't even feel that she was writing a journal anymore. She just, she was simply in a conversation with the, the uh, Mother Mary. So uh, I don't know all the details of the things that she said, but you know, we can just imagine that, you know, she constantly hailed the, 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 the Virgin Mary for all the things that she did for her, all the support that she offered her uh, throughout her whole life. So so when she when she, you know, uh, as she was continuing to write these journals, 
you know, her, her life was beginning to, to come to an, you know, come to an end at some point. And people were finding a lot about her now. All the people in the city were hearing about this, this great saint, you know, Saint Veronica. And actually, many people like the, uh, the Duchess or like the Duke uh, uh, of that city, uh, a lot of prominent government people, uh, people in the government uh, wanted to go and visit her. I think there was like another like famous lady there, too. You know, who was sick, like she had a problem with her eyes. And when she went to that monastery, immediately when she saw St. Veronica, her eyes were healed because she needed to get healing from the saint. So so a lot of people were finding out about her. So uh, at that point, when she had seen so many miraculous works, God began to show her um, sort of the opposite now. He like gave her actually visions of of, of hell because she wanted people to know how scary hell was you see e even 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 part of our salvation is to have that 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 fear that fear I I in a way and and we need to have we need to have some of that because because that sometimes is the way to sal it, 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 it a lot of times it is the way to salvation right so so she would see a lot of different souls just basically just burning up Tons of souls and pits of snakes and uh, people chained up, and fiery chains and and you know they were you know and she saw like the throne of Satan and that he would look back at all the people who were suffering and they would all look back at him and it, it was just just awful awful torment right and she even said that she saw um, purgatory she claimed that she saw purgatory which were people who were going through torment after torment after torment for a certain period of time and then through her prayers she saw the souls of those in purgatory uh ascending into heaven so the idea that there's a place of purgatory this temporary place of suffering so to speak uh, but you know they end up becoming saved so do you, uh do you think there actually is a purgatory uh you know when we when we see these accounts of the saints um we have to we have to sort of take it with a grain of salt. I mean, we do see people today who say that they saw visions of hell that that you know they they experienced some suffering and then they came back to life and then we're living to tell the people about this. So so this element of like uh, temporary suffering or or that God is is showing judgment on somebody, but he gives them kind of a second chance to repent. You know, mid of their life, you know, if they go through an accident or pass away in the hospital, they come back to life and they get that that second chance, you know, to repent. Yeah, there's actually there's actually lots of stories about that. Like um, I have a book. It's called Beyond Death's Door, where this doctor, um, he he was an atheist originally, and he compiled all these accounts because he started noticing like uh, people that were um kind of in and out like near death started screaming all kinds of weird things like uh you know don't let me die i'm burning and all this kind of stuff and yeah. so he compiled he wrote down like a lot of the uh, testimonies that he received from people that had been resuscitated and they were all very very different well there there's definitely i mean look there's definitely a hell i mean they they the 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 you know the stories are also endless with people yeah. who Oh hell! I mean, that's it, it. Even you know, the Bible, you know, it, even talks about it, and 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 all the traditions. We all know that you know salvation is being in heaven with the Lord, and hell is just eternal, just a separation from God, just eternal darkness and suffering. So this idea of purgatory, when the saints are are, are documenting these things, we we do have to respect and honor them. So, you know, you know, maybe there is some temporary form. Uh, the, the Orthodox Church does not agree with that. Um, you know, th this idea that there's this temporary place and, they, and then they get saved later. Um, but, uh, you know, there is certainly God's mercy is endless. I mean, yeah. God, God tells us many times in Scripture, judge not and you will not be judged. Your mercy endures forever. Uh, you know, uh, you know, God, I mean, numerous verses, 
I mean, of people who who basically like, you know, just when they think that, you know, they're they're just the worst of sinners. Christ is continuously lending out his hand, lending out the forgiveness. So, you know, I, I you know, I can't make a, a firm conclusion on that. But, you know, that's what she that is what she saw. So so I personally I, I have to honor that if that is what's in the journals then then you know there is there is this temporary place of suffering but you know i, I don't know I, I don't know the all the details i don't know if it's something that you know uh it was something at the time that she saw that uh maybe represented uh people on earth who were suffering maybe she didn't know what it was in the vision and just kind of framed it you know framed it that no, way no. like but what we can say, we can say is, I think the best thing to get out of it was just the mercy of God. It's just to, just to understand that it's not about whether purgatory exists or not, but the fact that she saw people being tormented, like torment after torment after torment, and then being saved, that just goes to show you the mercy of God. That people, even people who are, you know, extremely disturbed, extremely disturbed mentally, can't seem to get it can't seem to uh, uh, find any peace in this life or find any solutions for, for anything. Mm -hmm. Even they have hope. For the ones who didn't have hope, even they have hope. So, so we, we have to bear that in mind. Now, she saw these experiences, and I can honestly tell you, this is the mission of the saints. They will see the glory of God. They'll see the suffering. And they'll see the, the the punishment. I mean, they really experience the full thing. Saints, that's why they were saints, because they saw the worst of things and they saw the best of things. And the best of things was to give us hope. The worst of things was to save us through that fear. So it all works for our salvation, right? So after she had seen these things, she began her life began to just be filled with grace at that point. So so she um they said that she had seen a vision later in her life. She was so in tune with the Virgin Mary that she saw a vision of her heart basically um becoming one with the Virgin Mary's heart. They were just sort of blended together and they were just together following the will of God. That's how close the, the Virgin Mary was to her. So um you know, I mean, this is this is really amazing. I mean, uh, it, it, she ended up uh, passing away. Um, like I said, I believe it was seventeen twenty-seven. I believe uh, when she passed. I mean, it's a. I guess she died on July 9th, seventeen twenty-seven, in Cita de Castillo. Um, you know, so that's Italy as well. It's just kind of further south a little bit. She her shrine is at the monastery of Saint Veronica Giuliana at the Cita de Casa. And the monastery that she stayed at was kind of like a little ways kind of northeast of that. So but still within, you know, the the city. So um you know, uh she her feast day, um I guess her feast feast day is the J July ninth. Right. So that's when they can go to the monastery and see her body. Three hundred and fifty years later, her body still to this day is incorruptible. You can go to her shrine today and you will see the body of St. Veronica at that monastery. Yeah, I actually um, I'm seeing some pictures of that. Uh, as you've been talking about it, I've been looking stuff up. It looks like the body is still there. You can go and see it's in some kind of glass case. Yep. It doesn't look like it's uh, decayed at all. So I guess that's there. Um, Matter of fact, even more, even more profound. I mean, that's kind of profound in itself, but even more profound, even, even more supernatural was when they were beginning to remove the organs. She had prayed that God would, would um, basically inscript her heart with all his tools of salvation so to speak and when they saw her heart it was literally imprinted with all these different symbols of 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 christ and and his salvation 
you know, whether it was, um, you know, a sword, a cross, um, you know, uh, 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 a anything, anything to do with with salvation. They saw this beautiful imprint on her heart, and it was greater than any art form which they had ever seen. And and I mean, you can't, I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up, man. But but that, that's that's what they saw. And her body also, I'm sure, emanated. Oh, they said that the heart. Yes, they said that that heart emanated a beautiful scent. Oh. So that is incredible in itself. And people are still finding out about this same story. When I mean, we're talking about 350 years later, okay, and people are just learning about her still. And she's a huge saint. I mean, I mean, you know, so we, you know, we have to keep in mind that they had a big mission that they had to fulfill. And, and some of the things that they did was it's kind of seems ahead of our time. Maybe that's why her story wasn't revealed so soon, because maybe <laughs> I mean, maybe there's just some things that people cannot fully understand or comprehend. Anybody who's who's listening to these stories, I'm saying, you know, about suffering and, and this and this and that and all the things that she went through. These are things that we're still trying to understand and learn about the lives of the saints were so deep and they're so they're so filled with so much so many different stories and so many experiences that we cannot just try to understand everything all at once right so this was a great saint she's honored today and there was a young brother from lebanon i think his name was brother Jamud, I believe, who was healed by St. Veronica. He, he got ill and he was healed. Uh, the, a guy who was writing uh, began to write the documentary of the story of St. Veronica. He met this man uh, who wanted to share his story with him. I guess he was just trying to find some people who knew about her. And then he found this, this young man um, uh, who was healed by her. And then this young man passed away, ended up passing away at the age of 33. So miracles people will begin i'm sure just like just like there's another saint called saint rita and and she actually was a huge saint as well and people didn't know about her till 500 years after her passing and 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 that's when people started getting miracles from her they didn't even know who she was it was a nun that would answer her the the these people's prayers and they would say well who is this nun and this is and that and she would say well i'm i'm saint rita and then they would go back and then try to figure out who the St. Rita was. And then they go to the convents and you'd find that their stories, their journals have been preserved and they'll tell you everything about that saint. But as long as no one inquires or knows or hears about these saints, a lot of times it'll just be concealed. And even the nuns claim that if people knew all the miracles that were happening at that convent, through the blessings of St. Veronica, they would be kissing all the walls all day long. So, you know, that is that is very profound uh, that we are still learning about this saint's uh, story. Um, you know, and it's just, it's really amazing how the strongest of people, I mean, the strongest of people were the saints. They were, they were the ones that took the suffering for mankind as Christ, and they sacrificed for for others, for the salvation of others. So, um, you know, I, I'm so glad that her story is is you know people are still are continuing to learn about her uh, because she definitely deserves to be honored and, and heard about. And I can assure you, I can definitely assure you that. This saint will be a, a huge intercessor. The Catholics, the Orthodox, always believe in, that saints can intercede on their behalf, you know, um, and and she will certainly be a great intercessor and um, and and very close to the Virgin Mother. So we 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 do understand that she really is uh, a, a, not just a saint, not just a soldier for Christ, but she is truly a mother. She is truly a mother in every sense of the word. And um, and I will go ahead from, from there and just turn it over to you, Ivor, 
Co watch, I'd like to thank you for, for your time. I'd like to thank our, our hearers, our, our, our listeners, our viewers, um, you know, for hearing about our story. I hope that, um, you know, uh, you guys can do more research about her or, uh, you know, under, learn more uh, about her or maybe pass on the story to other people. So uh, I think that'll certainly be a great uh, uh, blessing. So I will go to Fatus es natura mirante, unus renovatus es da Cristo regnante. Gaudete, 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 Christus es natus, es Maria Virgine, gaudete.